We're live. Hi, hello. My name is K.O. Morris. I'm the Bike Pot Program. Ah, just here. give it a second, actually. Sorry. Okay. Now we're live. Okay. Hi, hello. I'm I'm K.O. Morris, the Bike Pot Program and Digital Media Coordinator. And this is our Coil Black Voices is a monthly series where we talk with queer Black people about about their lives and, and their stories and, and to highlight our queer Black people. So today we have our OK State Rep from District 88, Marie Turner, and, and we are happy to have them. And let's get started. Or we'd like to introduce yourself, Marie. Yes. Um, uh, so Yes, my name is Maury Turner. My pronouns are they and sometimes she. I am the representative for Oklahoma's House District 88. And um, that's pretty much it. All right, let's get started. So you grew up in Oklahoma, a native Okie in Artmore. How was that like growing up? Uh, it was very interesting. Um, uh, I grew up in a single parent household, my, my dad and my granddad were both in and out of prison up until I was about, um, I don't know, maybe 12, 13. And, and so um, uh, it, with all of that, my mom worked two and three jobs. And so it, it, was, it was always very interesting because my mom showed me very early on what, what community organizing really looked like and what selfless, selfless love for community really looked like. Um, and so, so that was really great, but there were also times where I could probably count on one hand how many times I saw my mom in a week. Um, and so that's also how we got our bonding and it was community organizing and, and listening sessions and, and difficult conversations. And so, um, uh, and, and yeah, so it, inside the household, it was very an, an open and honest environment to, to grow and, and to, critically think, right? Um, and, but it also always looked a little bit different in, in practice, right? Like in education or, or um, spending time with other people's families looked different and, and things like that. And so um, growing up specifically in Ardmore was very formative, um, I, I will definitely say. And yeah, I'm not sure if I really answered your question though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that, 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 was, that was fine. Perfect. So, so you mentioned um, um, living in a very um, active household with your, with your mom, um, um, very involved in, in, in the community and civic engagement. Um, and, and back to you, you know, in, your, in your household, um, you, you identify as, um, well, you were born as or raised in a Baptist and Muslim household. Mm -hmm. um, how did that shape your your worldview growing up in Oklahoma? You know, a very um, white Christian um, society. How did that um, um, affect you growing up or, or shape your worldview? Yeah, I um, yeah. So you're absolutely right. Uh, my mom Baptist, my dad Muslim. They raised us with principles from both because even though my dad was incarcerated, my mom made sure that at every turn we had a connection with my mama. And so um, uh, she would take us to, to go and visit him when he, um, at, at whatever facility he was housed at. And she would also, um, uh, it was small town Oklahoma. So there was a point in time where uh, my dad was housed in a minimum security facility right outside of our town. And they would bring the folks who were incarcerated there into Ardmore to help set up for rodeos and things like that. And so um, one very distinct memory I have as a child is my mom going and picking my dad up and sneaking him back to the house and making him make us clean our rooms. And so he was very present and, and taught us a lot, a lot of formative lessons. And so it shaped my worldview and how I have become who I am today for a lot of different reasons. My mom and I had very early, like very, like very deep conversations early on about what it meant to, to be black in Oklahoma, right? Um, and, and what it meant to be queer in Oklahoma and a combination of those things. Um, and so it was very much so that early 
indoctrination of critical thinking, right? 9-11 um, happened when I was in third grade, I believe. And so um, making that conscious decision to not tell anybody that my dad was Muslim or what that really kind of looks like. Um, uh, and, and thinking about how, how my actions uh, and even how my actions could really affect everybody around me and, and what that looks like. So it, it it was formative for a lot of great reasons, but also played into that adultification of, of, of our Black youth um, and how we have to grow up, how we don't really get a childhood, how we have to grow up um, a lot sooner than other children. So formative. I really, really appreciate my upbringing um, and, and everything that I learned, right? But I also value children being able to be children, right? Being able to remain children. So. Yes, you, you said that, uh, I forgot, you, you said that um, the, the experience, how, how do you feel it is growing up Black and queer in Oklahoma? Um, how, how has that really, how, how has that process really affect you? And, and, and how has that bene benefited you? And how does that influence your um, decision making with, with policy? Um, for, for me, I think it's, it was formative for, or I think how it shapes my worldview and how it shapes my policy making is the fact that there are folks who live in this margin that, that aren't represented, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, in ideology, in, in, in physically being here at the Capitol. And so making sure that visibility is always a key part of the legislation that I, the legislation, the policy that I try to put forward, making sure um, uh, that that people have someone to look up to. I that was one of the conversations that my mother and I had early on was that um, I would often be the first, if the few, um, in a room. And, and one of the most formative life lessons that my mom taught me was that I was always going to have a powerful voice, and that I should always use mine and make sure that I'm doing everything that I can to make sure other people use theirs too, use and or find theirs too. Uh, and, and no matter what intersection you stand in, right? Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems your mom has been like, like, a, like a pillar in, in your life. Um, especially being involved in in, 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 in civic civic engagement, how how what what point in your life growing up did you did, did you say oh that's what I want to do with my life? What what moment did you realize that you wanted to be part of of of, of an active change in um, our society? I think it was something that I always just kind of did. Um, community service and, and, and community outreach was always something I was, I always like to do in my free time, um, volunteering and different things like that. And so that was just kind of cathartic for me, but I didn't know, hmm, let's see. But when people start asking you what you wanna be when you grow up, it was always a veterinarian because when I was growing up, I knew then that I wasn't necessarily a people person. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, people start asking you, I guess around first grade, what you want to be. And it was always a veterinarian because when I looked around my family, I saw people in the medical field in some way, shape or form. And so I was like, okay, I want to do that too. But I like animals, right? Um, so I took that with me up until my junior year of high, college. Um, uh, and so I, I went to school to become a veterinarian and, um, but also loving to do community service, loving to do community outreach, started doing organizing and, and campus relations with the NAACP, started interning for the Council on American Islamic Relations um, and, and just, and also doing things like the big event, right? Um, uh, which is a community service uh, program that, that OSU used to have. And so it was something I always knew I wanted to, like I always knew I could fall back on and not like necessarily job wise, but that was, that's just how I stress relief, right? Is to be able to help community. And so my junior year though, I am interning with care and my mom doesn't leave our hometown too much. But this evening she did, and she came up to, to go to an event that uh, uh, CARE was putting on. And so 
she came up with me and, and we got a phone call and the phone call was from my great uncle in Stillwater and he told me that my dad had had a really bad four-wheeler accident and so for the next week I got to sit by his side and listen to his story and I got to process things through an adult lens that I couldn't as a child because I hadn't spoken to him truly um, uh, up until that point since uh, around the last time that he was released uh, from the carceral system and so in listening to him, understanding his story and hearing that he always wanted to be a teacher and, and, and processing all of this, I realized that Oklahoma's justice system does a really bang up job of keeping families incarcerated long after they've left our prison industrial complex, right? When it comes to reentry programs, when it comes to being able to find a stable job again, um, when it comes to being able to register to vote, right? And run for office, all these types of things. And so, that was the week, which I think was about the third week of April, the second or the third week of April. Uh, and that week I decided I, I didn't want to do veterinary medicine anymore. I mean, I still loved it, right? But my calling was being able to, to truly help people, right? To be able to, to truly make a difference. And so I threw everything I could into um, uh, my sociology and my political science and, and looked for folks who were doing holistic justice reform. And at that mm -hmm. point in time, the only conversation I had heard was how much money we could save taxpayers if we did criminal justice reform. But I was looking for people who were working on eliminating the school to prison pipeline, right? Folks who were worried about reentry program, folks were, programs, folks who were worried about um, uh, putting an end to predatory lending. Uh, and so I found the ACLU, um, and, and that was how I ended up uh, on that front. And so um, there were a lot of things that really kind of shaped how I ended up where I am, right? I, I, I don't think I could have been at this specific place without meeting everybody that I had, right? Without trying everything I had. I did a little bit of journalism. Um, uh, I did a little bit of everything at OSU and, and before I was a, a little bit of a librarian at one point in time. Um, uh, and so um, I, the thing is, that it, my life is very much so not a monolith and, and I am very much so at very, I guess intersectional in more ways than one, but but there are a lot of things that really kind of led to me realizing that that specifically community organizing was my calling, and I get to do that in a really kind of unhinged and not in the worst way, right? But in a in a really kind of unencumbered way now that I am a representative uh, that it, that feels really interesting um, and really heavy sometimes, but also really right. Yes, so you you mentioned that you spent some time at, at the ACLU. Can can you um explain some of the the work you did? Because I, I I know that you um campaign on on on, on criminal justice reform, and part of that is, is some things that you um worked on at the ACLU. Um, would you would you care to um to um to explain the, the, the process that, that went on? For sure. So um, uh, yeah, when I did my work at the ACLU, it was specifically around justice reform, I think was, was the language that we were using. You know, people use the language that, that, that we are given, right? Um, and I think what we find now is that it's not necessarily a system that can be reformed, but it has to be reimagined with everybody in mind. And so um, uh, that transformative work to, to justice system reimagining and rebuilding. And so that was what I did in, in trying to find the many intersections of what that looked like. And so um, it looked like going and talking to high school students about how to get involved. Some of the conversations that I had with high school students were, um, which it, they were really powerful, but also really heavy because high school students were asking me how to protect their friends and families when they came in contact with police officers. And I think it's really telling that our high school students in Oklahoma are asking how to de-escalate situations with police officers. When that's one of the number one conversations when I'm that I'm having with our children, with our babies, I can't help but feel prideful, but also very hurt, right? Because supposedly our law enforcement officers are supposed to be um, uh, the masters of de-escalation, right? 
um, uh, they are charged with, with de-escalating and protecting our communities. And, and when high schoolers realize that, that that's not how it happens, right? Um, uh, it's jarring a little bit. It mm -hmm. gives me hope for the future. So that was what I did kind of like on the high school front. Uh, it's like also with, with law students, I remember giving presentations on how we get involved in activism and how we utilize those things for the better. Um, uh, it also looked like um, uh, I was able to do uh, an, an impacted people's um, uh, round table where we would all meet up and have dinner and share resources, right? So if someone had just found housing where you could find housing, um, uh, where you could find a job, different things like this. And so um, it looked, it took, my work was able to morph into a lot of different ways that helped community in ways that um, I guess other people hadn't done just yet. So, so that was really um, powerful. It looked like listening sessions on how we should go about um, uh, writing legislation or how we should um, uh, figure out how, how to lobby for people in, in the best way. And it looked like creating those lobby days at the Capitol. Um, uh, and so it, it my work um, at the ACLU is much so like myself, very intersectional, trying to meet people where they are continuously. Um, because my big thing is that there's always a, a place for everybody in the movement. You just have to figure out what works best for you. And, and there is a calling for it. So, yeah, um, that was, I guess, that's how my work looked at the ACLU. That's amazing. Um, looking back, it, it seems, um, from the outside looking in and, and hearing your story, it seems like you were destined to, to be where you're at right now. Um, and 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 you ran for 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 office and, and and you won and 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 you became america's first state legislator that is non-binary and, and it happened in in oklahoma and how does that make you feel what was that feeling like um i guess there's a lot to it and It's really powerful. And some of, I guess maybe some of the best and worst ways, if I'm being completely honest. Um, what I love about my style of community organizing is that I get to lay the groundwork for some really amazing work, but I also get to sit back and watch the work thrive, right? Flourish before my eyes, but in a way where people get to take it and it spreads like wildfire in the best kind. Um, and that's just what I like about doing the work. It's very authentic. It's very raw. It's very real. Thank and, you. huh? Oh, nothing. Could continue, please. Uh, and so when I hit the ground running in my work at the ACLU. I also was asking people like, and, and being able to, to witness directly at the Capitol, that merging of, of community organizing and direct policy advocacy, what that looked like and what that really meant for people mm -hmm. um, and how we have the power as legislators, right? To, to make and break people's lives um, and how it's, it, That power and that power without shared lived experience can be very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. When we don't have, when we have allies who don't necessarily know how to be allies, but but love, but can show up in, in name, but not in action, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I hit the ground running at the ACLU, I started asking people like, why haven't you run for office? Like why? would you plan on it? Like, how could we get you there as well? Those were conversations that I was having. And so realizing the hurdles that Oklahoma politics, like that our Oklahoma government puts before people who have been impacted by the system, right? Whether that's financially or, or when it comes to voting or, or civic engagement as a whole. Um, and so then people started to ask me when I was going to run for office and why I haven't, and if I would run for office, specifically here in House District 88, and because I lived here. Um, uh, and so um, people started to ask me 
about running for office. And I think one of the big things about community organizing and that is that it's also a call to action. Mm -hmm. um, it's about continuously answering a call to action and filling the gaps that our government leaves for us. And I know what I always want from my representative, because I never planned on running for office. I always told myself I, I would dedicate my time to finding the best representative. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that was where the work would end for me, right? And, and, and finding for and making sure they got elected in any way I could. Mm -hmm. So when people started asking me, um, uh, it was it took a lot of conversations, right? A lot of convincing and a, and a lot of me really sitting with the imposter syndrome that comes along with it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so when I finally, I guess, had decided that I was going to take it seriously and, and jump, but it was the feelings in the beginning, it kind of morphed from imposter syndrome to, to realizing that there were folks like outside of the folks that I had talked to that were really wanting change and would do anything that they could do to get it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so being able to jump because I, I like to do everything myself and I, and I it just kind of short and concise and I, and I know if I do it, then it gets done, right? And mm -hmm. so being able to, to put faith, um, not only in just like one other person, but an entire community of people um, took a lot for me. Um, but once I did it and I realized that people were really excited about the race and were really happy about shared lived experiences and were really happy about being civically engaged again because our campaign hinged on turning out a new electorate of people who, who hadn't felt seen or heard by politics in a long time. And that, uh, I think that's part of this work is that it's, if you're doing it right, it is always a double-edged sword, equal parts humbling and gut-wrenching. Um, and so to see people's faith restored was really remarkable. And it's just kind of an additive that I get to be the person um, uh, that people lean on, right? Um, in their hard times. And so it's really great, right? Um, uh, some weeks I will say are harder than others, mm -hmm. um, but, but I wouldn't trade, uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't trade anything, uh, any part about of it, any part about it for the world. So. Awesome. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad you ran it because it, it, it showed us that, you know, when, when, when you run on, on, on inclusion and, 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 and bettering the society as a whole and, and, and saying that, there might be people like you, but I can show up and be that person that, that that's new at the table to bring you with me. And, and, and I'm, so, I'm so glad you ran because that's what Oklahoma needed. And, 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 and it shows that, that that's where we're headed, you know? So, so with that being said, you won, you, you, you won your, your own, your, your, your campaign district, whatever. What, do you hope to, com to, to accomplish um, while you're in office? Um, I guess contrary to common belief, and, and it's actually how it might happen for my other coworkers, is that it's not just, for me, it's not just about creating equitable policy, mm -hmm. but it's about relational organizing, that community organizing. Um, uh, I think that's one of the biggest things that's missing from the Capitol. And I think that's very apparent for me anyway, after this week is that um, uh, my job here is not just to create equitable policy, but also to change this institution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and that's within my party and, and, and also within um, uh, the institution. I think we're having some technical difficulties. Yes, we are. Please bear with us as we sort this out. Sorry, if you're just now tuning in, this is our Queer Black Voices, um, our first series. Um, it will be a monthly series of, of queer Black people 
tell, telling their stories and, and, and getting to know them better. And, to, and tonight we have Marie Turner, um, House District OK Rep 88. Bear with us as we get Marie back. Bear with us as we are fixing the technical issues that we are having. Hi there, if you're just now tuning in, um, this is Queer Black Voices, a conversation with Maury Turner. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, we lost connection with them on their end. So, um, KO, oh, here they come. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Sorry about that. We had a little technical issues, but but we are we are back and, and at it. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, but um, uh, so essentially, just long story short, I'm sorry about that. Um, my job here is not just to create policy, but also to change the culture on how we critically think about how we do this work. Right, not even just with working with one another, but when we create policy that it that affects people's everyday lives, we should be able to think about that, right? And to think about how these things ripple out and we don't serve a monolith. Um, and so it's important that that we are always thinking about that. Um, uh, so it, 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 it is far more than, than just writing policy. And, and I wish I had the time to list it all out, but there's a lot of work before us. And so the hope is that more folks will come in 2022 so yes yes they're coming they're coming and and we're already here and what we're coming um so um the 58 legislator you uh, you introduced um numerous bills but um um house bill 2107 um would make um legislative reports and legislative matters measures gender neutral in their language um how how important is this bill to you and to um the lgbtq community Sorry, can you say that one more time for me? Yes, House Bill on 2107 that you that you author for the 58 legislative session mm -hmm. would make legislative reports gender neutral um, in their measures and in, in, in their language. Um, how important is, is this bill um, to you and, and, and to our LGBTQ community? Uh, I, for me personally, I always think that um, uh, visibility is important. So what this bill does, and I know that like the words are very tricky and everything's written in legalese. So essentially just in layman's terms, what this bill does is it would make every piece of legislation written from 2022 on gender neutral. Um, uh, and so here's the thing about it. I think it's a very important. I wouldn't have brought any of these ideas before the body if I didn't think that they were important and the conversations that come from them to be important also. Um, uh, but the thing is that in, at any point in time, I think our uh, the folks who write legislation could, could very easily just say, I'm not gonna say he and she, I'm gonna say they and them to make it more inclusive, right? Because we do not only have he's and she's in the world. So, um, uh, and, and history has told us that, right? That's not a new thing. So, um, uh, uh, but, but this legislation would ensure that that would happen. And so 
Um, I think it's very important. I think it's very important that it passes. Um, I, I will always err on the side of inclusion um, uh, rather than anything else. So, yeah. And, and another bill, I'll, um, I'm just going to mention a couple bills that, that you author because you author nu numerous bills. Um, but another House Bill 2108 um, will allow a person's gender marker to be changed by um, um, by an affidavit um, request. Um, and we know that getting your gender markers changed isn't an easy process, and it, is, it isn't a process that people take lightly. Um, so, how would this um, bill um, help that situation for our for our peoples? For sure. So, um, also, uh, just to put it in layman's terms, what that means is that, uh, so you know how um, if you have gotten an absentee ballot, uh, if you got one in 2020, then they make you sign an affidavit that says, like, I'm doing this and it is for ethical reasons. Um, all of my information is correct. So that's the same process that getting a gender marker change would go under. You wouldn't have to show that you have had surgery um, or anything like that. Uh, I think the, this is really important for a lot of different reasons. Um, and just a few of those are the fact that not everybody wants surgery, um, one. And two, not everybody needs surgery, right? Um, um, uh, but also three, not everybody can afford surgery. And just because I can't afford surgery doesn't mean that I should be allowed to show up fully as myself. And the Oklahoma legislature should not be dictating how that works for people. Um, especially when we have things that we can legislate on, like um, uh, like funding for, for folks who, who have been displaced because of COVID and beyond COVID, right? Because COVID didn't bring any new issues about, but it really highlighted the fact that one, just about every other Oklahoman is one or two paychecks away from being impoverished themselves and or, or homeless or unhoused and and two um uh really highlighted the fact that this is how everyday people live but now it's in our faces and we can't deny it but anyway though so yes house bill 2108 um would do away with having to prove that you have had surgery in order to get a gender marker change um uh and i think that's really important i think it preserves the life of of so many young queer folks so many older queer folks too right um uh is that um uh and and i i just think it's important i think it's needed it is, it is. okay and another house bill that um that you author is house bill 2109 yep. um, will require state with will require state forms mm, i am so sorry guys no it's fine house, house bill 2109 will require state formed with gender markets requests to offer nine non-binary options can, can you um elaborate on house bill 2109 Absolutely. So um, what 2109 does in layman's terms as well is that so every piece of paperwork that the state requires you fill out and you have to check a male or female box, it also gives a non-binary op option as well. Um, uh, so if it's a piece of paperwork that you have that requires you fill out male or female, um, it would create a non-binary option as well. Yes. Um and, and is, is there any other bills you would like to um to, to let our audience know tonight that that you feel is very near and dear to your heart or that would be very beneficial for for them to know about yeah i think those are kind of those are my three that are geared towards um inclusion in that aspect also um 2103 would create oklahoma's restoration of voting rights act and so um uh uh, and so what that does is one of the big things that I saw at the ACLU um, was that folks after they left the prison system, um, uh, sorry about that, after they left the prison system, um, uh, they weren't sure when they could register to vote again. Um, uh, and then there, because nobody really holds that information, we would go from the election board and the election board would tell us to go to the court and the court would say, well, you need to talk to your attorney, right? And so everyone's just kind of kicking this ball down or kicking this can down the road and nobody knows when they can vote again, which inhibits a lot of people from even wanting to vote again, right? Um, and so uh, we made sure, so, so this piece of legislation would say, after you leave the prison, um, after you leave, uh, 
uh, Oklahoma's prison industrial complex. Um, as soon as you are or leave those those four walls that you can register to vote again. Um, I, and I know some people might be a little upset about that um, uh, because I, for one, would love to be able to say, um, do like other states, right? And say, if you are incarcerated, you are still, people still count you in their population, so you can still vote. I'd love to do legislation like that. But I'm also trying to be a little bit realistic about what it is that we can do and push over the, the finish line in Oklahoma. But I don't think that that's something that's unattainable. I think it's just a little bit further down the road. Um, uh, and so yet again, that's 2103. I think another one that is uh, really uh, near and dear to my heart, I, I, it's my legislation, they're all near and dear to my heart, but I won't um, uh, bend your ear. I will say one other one that I um, uh, that I think is really important is, um, is 2105. And so what that does is make courts disclose the full range of sentences to juries. Another one of the things that I heard um, often while in my time at the ACLU was that after juries would find someone guilty, then they would find out that if you find some in Oklahoma, if you find some, and we're only a, like we're one of a handful, maybe three states, I think, um, that still do this. But if you find someone guilty, they're automatically going to prison. The only thing left is to figure out how long they're going to prison. And so um, uh, you hear sometimes jurors will say, well, if I knew that they were going to have to go to prison, then I wouldn't have found them guilty because this person needs rehabilitation or they could just do or needs to go to, to rehab or they could do community service, things like that. And so the hope is that um, uh, we can start with um, uh, making sure that courts are disclosing the full range of sentences to juries and then um, also um, be able to move to a place to where if we are going to um, do that, we can move to a kind of a dual system where juries can not only um, uh, find their, do their sentences, but also say, um, uh, or uh, do their convictions, but also say, while we find this person guilty, we also want to send them to rehabilitation. This is not a person that needs to be in jail or, or prison, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, I think, also something that might be a little bit later um, down the road. I'm not saying it's something that Oklahomans don't want. I'm saying it's something that the legislature probably doesn't want. Mm. Um, uh, so, so those are, are things that, that, are, that are coming up and that I really um, care about. I think they're, um, uh, let's see. Um, there's also one that, um, I've also got one that's a standard. So 20, 2104, um, uh, what it does is create a standard minimum requirement for mm -hmm. law enforcement officers across, um, uh, uh, across Oklahoma. So right now, if you go to different areas, the requirements to become a law enforcement officer looks different. And um, uh, sometimes what we also see is that um, something will happen with a law enforcement officer at a facility and, um, uh, and so they'll be removed from their position and then they'll just go and serve someplace else. So this creates a standard of, of uh, a standard for what all law enforcement officers across Oklahoma should have and should be, right? Um, uh, cleat certified, um, should be 25. I, I raised the, so the number one pushback we get from that is that, um, uh, I raised the, the minimum age from 21 to 25. Um, and so I was able to sit down with the chief, um, with one of the, not the chief of police of Oklahoma City, but a chief of police um, uh, last week and explain. Um, and I think if more people understood, maybe they would uh, also realize, but anyway. So the re my reasoning for changing it from 21 to 25 is that science tells us that your brain is not fully developed until you are 25 years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we know, uh, we know, we know young kids are prone to do um, dumb things, but also we can see that adults are prone to do dumb things too, right? Um, and so the hope is that we can kind of eliminate some of those things and, and, um, uh, and, and move, uh, move that part forward. Also does away with, so in some places you can take a lie detector test and I think that's kind of seen as your mental health screening mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and lie detector tests aren't based in science. Uh, so, um, does away with that, that as well. Um, 
but yeah, so uh, so I, I think the the need to standardize hiring for law enforcement officers across Oklahoma is something that's really needed, um, uh, and and couples well with some other pieces of legislation that my colleagues are doing. So yes, um, so um, to, to get more information about how you can take action at home, um, if you go to www.okeq.org. Um, and select the Take Action tab. Um, you will select My Oklahoma Town Hall and click 2021 legislation. And you will see all the bills um, that are out in the legislation that are up for vote. Um, if you can call your, your, your legislator about the good bills and bad bills that OKEQ supports and don't support to ensure that we are being inclusive and mindful of the bills that we pass, that these bills affect our lives and your vote matter you matter and we should ensure that everyone in this country is treated with respect and dignity. Um, with that being said, I would like to open up the chat for questions for, for Marie or myself. And if you have any questions, just just um, type them in the Facebook um, comments and we can get to them. And thank you again, Marie, for 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 having this conversation with me, and and we greatly appreciate it and all the work that, that you're doing to serve our um, our, our great state. No worries. I, I really appreciate you for reaching out. Um, uh, and it was really nice to be able to do this. I'm not tech savvy. Sorry about the glitch in the middle. Um, uh, but but no, this was absolutely wonderful. So I'm always happy to be able to talk to people. Okay, I'm I'm not seeing any um. Any questions? But I, I do know earlier today, me and Anna, um, one of my coworkers behind the scenes, helping us run this wonderful conversation, had a question. And <laughs> do you remember what that question was, Anna? I guess not. Okay. How does your identity as a queer person affect your relationship with your faith community? And how does your identity as a Muslim affect your relationship with the LGBTQ community? Um, I want to make it a point to, because I think this is a question I get a lot, which I think is very interesting. Um, uh, but what we do when we ask questions like this is sometimes we make people relive some really, I don't know, some really kind of bad trauma between what happens when we, when, when that clash between religion and sexuality, um, uh, happens sometimes. And, and so just to, I, I guess, just want to start by putting that out there um, is that sometimes when we ask questions like this, we make people relive some of the worst trauma of their life, right? And sometimes we don't understand that that's what we're doing. Um, uh, so just want to name that. Um, Molly, thank you for saying that. Um, and if you don't want to answer the question, I'm sorry. And thank you so much for telling me that. So I don't ask a question like this again and put anyone in this situation. So thank you so much for telling me that. No worries, no worries. I just, I just um, want to name that because um, it, it's not just you. It, it is literally a question I get probably about once a week, um, uh, and I think um, for for me personally, it, um, what I will say is at this point in my life, it doesn't inhibit it. But um, early on, uh, it was it was really hard to grapple with, um, and so I guess that that is what I will say about that. Um, but I do, I do always appreciate, and I want to stress again that I am not trying to shame anyone or harm anyone or, 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 or belittle anyone, I guess is what I should say. Um, uh, but just want to throw that out there for, for anybody watching. Um, so yeah. Yes, no, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's something I didn't know. And now that I am aware of, I, I can make that mental note and correct myself in, um, in, in future conversations um, with, with anyone. Um, we do have another question. Um, yeah. um, as an ally, as, as an ally to the LGBTQ plus community, what support do you need from us, and what more can we do to help you in your work? Um. Uh, wait, can you say that one more time for me? Yes. Um. So this person is um is um cisgender straight ally, 
to the LGBT the LGBTQ plus community? What support do we need from us? And what more can we do to help you and your award? For sure. Um, I well, one, thank you so much for that question. I I think for I think one of the big things about a question like that is that allyship for everybody looks different, right? And so for me personally, um, I can say that when I am looking for, for allies or, or what I like to call accomplices, right? People who are actively working with us is, is people who are doing not only the out front work, but the shadow work, right? To make sure that we are, we, we are reading, right? We are doing our research. Um, there's nothing I love more than when a friend reads an article and says like, this is what I've been reading. Um, this is what I've been researching. Like, can you tell me how you feel about it? Um, uh, I, I would much prefer that rather than someone saying like, hey, what's a good book to read? Or, hey, um, uh, what's a good podcast? Like I get those questions more often from strangers than, than from friends, but, um, but that's, um, or can you teach me about this, right? Rather than saying like, this is what I found out, let's talk about it. Um, because that means that you are putting that labor back on us to teach you. And yeah. I'm not an expert on everything, right? Um, uh, I got to be where I am today, I think from a combination of classroom and, 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 and the good old streets of Oklahoma. Um, uh, and so um, I think it's important to note that if you truly care about the people around you, you are doing the research, right? You are doing the research to see how you care for them. Um, and then you're engaging in those conversations in a way that doesn't make people relive trauma, doesn't make people have to, to, to continuously teach you, but you're saying like, I am willing to put the time in, right? Whenever we, when we are outside of this space, when I'm by myself, I'm willing to put the time in. Um, it also means showing up. For me personally, as a legislator, what I would love is if you could call some, um, uh, some committee chairs and say like, I heard this bill is coming up and I really love it and this is why. Can you please get a hearing on the House floor or, or can you please put it uh, in committee for a hearing, right? And so, um, and that might've sounded sarcastic, but I seriously mean that. So if there were any bills that I put forward that you really like, um, uh, I'd love it if you um, uh, would research the, the chairs that, um, uh, uh, I would love it if you would research the chairs of the committees that they are that have been assigned to, so that they can um, uh, so that they can hopefully give them a hearing on the House floor, right? That's at the pl that's the place we're at right now um, is trying to get um, trying to get bills heard on the committee floor. So um, that's uh, in my professional um, uh, in, in my professional hat. That's what what I would love for for an ally or an accomplice right now, um, but. It, in your friends and your families, in those safe spaces, it's also important to let people know that it's okay um, to not be okay, right? Um, it's okay to need a safe space to land, right? Um, and, and, and to have that space to process with one another, I think is really important and informative for, for folks in the LGBTQ2S um, uh, plus community, um, knowing that they have people who, who might not understand everything that they're going through, but are willing to listen and learn with them, I think is, um, Kind of like an overarching bigger answer so um i think we have time for one more questions for one more question um if anyone would like to to um to send one out um okay we, we have one more um um so it says please support the five the, the, the freedmen of the five tribes against racist policies within these tribes. Strange or not, the same tribes that discriminate against their black members are the same ones that have strong anti-gay laws too. Mm -hmm. So, so with so with that being said, um, um, I I know that we have had some 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 trouble history where um, where, where black Creeks are are black natives and 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 getting access to um. To the, to the same um, 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 resources of, of their non-Black tribal um, partners are, are um, citizens. So, it, so with that being said, do you support um, um, Black freemen um, being able to, to exist fully under um, these Native constitutions? And, and yeah. Uh, I, I think, 
Yes, yes, I do. Long story short, um, I come from a line of freedmen myself. And so um, I think um, sovereignty and inclusion, um, especially when it comes to amenities uh, of uh, tribal lands and, and uh, tribal citizenship as a whole is really, really important. Um, and, and I will say that I am not an expert on everything, right? Um, there are a lot of things that I'm still learning, right? And there are a lot of people um, that I'm still learning from and a lot of research that I'm still doing myself. So um, uh, I guess without droning on too much, I think that that is uh, the very least I can do is show up and, and support my siblings in this fight, right? So, um, yeah. All right, um, I said that was, that was our last question, but I have one more. Someone kind of came in late. Um, okay. Very simple. Um, what is your educational background? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure what you mean, but <laughs> I, I started out in four-year-old program, uh, and then I went to Early Childhood Center, I went to Lincoln Elementary, I went to Ardmore Middle School, Ardmore High School, and then I went to Oklahoma State University. Um, did a little bit of journalism, a little bit of uh, animal science, pre-veterinary medicine, uh, a little bit of uh, sociology and political science. So, um, uh, and then and then at, outside of that is just the the mean streets of the hard knocks. So, um, if that's if that's what you're asking, yeah, I I feel like that's what that's what the question was. Okay, I, I, I one more question is from me. That's fine. Um. Um, what is your favorite animal? This is a really good question. They're all really good questions. They are all really good questions. But nobody has asked me this. And my favorite animal is actually the okapi. Mm. It is half giraffe and half zebra. Like quite literally, I think the back half is zebra and the front half is giraffe. Oh, so wow. um, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. I think it comes from Central Africa. Oh, as soon as we get done, I'm going to have to Google it. See what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, Marie, thank you so much for having this, this conversation with Oklahoma for Equality on Queer Black Voices. This is a monthly series, again, um, to, to talk to our queer Black individuals in Oklahoma and, and to hear their stories and, and to highlight them. And we are so thank, thankful for all the work that you are doing for the state of Oklahoma and, and Indian country. And, and we wish you the best and, and we got you. Thank you. So good to be here with you all tonight. And thank you so much for all the questions, all of them. All right. Thank you so much. We see, we'll see you next time. Hey. Okay.